Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the afternoon session of our public kickoff of the Aspen Leadership Forum on Retirement Savings. I'm Tim Shaw, Associate Director of Policy for the Aspen Financial Security Program. And I hope everyone who joined us this morning had a good break and had some good time to reflect on the great discussion we had this morning. Uh, if there are some folks who are just tuning in for the afternoon, I do wanna fill you in on a bit of the highlights that we had from the morning. We opened with Ida Rademacher from the Aspen, Aspen FSP and Deb Whitman from AARP with an update on the history of the forum that we're at right now and how the conversations in the retirement field have evolved since we began holding the forum. The retirement field has embraced access to workplace retirement savings as a more explicit goal. And there was a lot of great conversation about how at the beginning of these conversations, there are a lot of disparate views and a lot of having to get on the same page. But over time and to now, that has coalesced into really a, a clarity on what the challenges are facing the retirement field and what the goals ought to be. And Deb noted that as part of that, 30 states to date have either started or proposed plans on bringing state auto IRAs into their states in the past few years. In addition, we've started to expand the idea of what the retirement systems can do for people. And the importance of short-term savings as a buffer to protect against retirement withdrawals for emergencies has been a growing theme in our conversations. These same themes and concepts were reflected in the panel that we had following uh, following that conversation about what 2020 could teach us and the pandemic can teach us about retirement savings. Morningstar, Morningstar CEO Kanal Kapoor shared findings from a survey jointly conducted by Morningstar, ourselves at Aspen FSP, DCIA, and NORC, on that while the pandemic did cause many to withdraw from, from their retirement savings, emergency savings provided an important buffer against withdrawals and boosted financial security. Wisconsin State Treasurer Sarah Godlewski highlighted that the relevance of these findings were really important for her state and the work she's done recently on financial security with Wisconsinites. And why as part of that and in conversations she had with workers in Wisconsin, she recommended a state auto IRA with an emergency savings compo component as a policy priority for Wisconsin that was even more important after hearing from people during the pandemic. Nari Reed, director of the Retirement Security Program at UC Berkeley, reminded us that all of these retirement security issues can't be disentangled from financial security problems more broadly. That during the pandemic, UI was a critical financial security lifeline for families, and that it also preserved retirement savings. And as we go into the future of these conversations, we can't ignore things like the income gap and wages that feed directly into uh, the retirement gaps that we see in the system. And finally, running through all of these discussions is the fact that the system has historically not worked for everyone. The retirement saving system is part of the racial wealth gap in this country that has been driven by a history of, of racism and racist policies and that those gaps exist across issues. Uh, and importantly, the leaders in today's discussion and the ones this afternoon are making closing that gap and addressing racial equity a priority. So those were the discussions we had this morning and I'm excited uh, to, to fill you in on what we're going to be doing this afternoon that builds right on top of those discussions. First, uh, we'll be led off by a keynote from Chairman Neal of the House Ways and Means Committee who will kick us off with remarks discussing his priorities for retirement policy in Congress. We then have a great panel lined up on whether we have the pieces we truly need for a truly equitable retirement system. And if so, what do we need to do to fit those pieces together? I think there are gonna be some great conversations and I'm excited that you all are here to, to hear them. Uh, a couple housekeeping notes just quickly and just as reminders for folks this morning, if you wanna tweet and help us expand this conversation, please follow us at Aspen FSP and we're using the hashtag Aspen FSP Live. In addition for our panel this afternoon, we won't have a Q&A section of the panel, but instead if please do use the Q&A section because we'll be feeding the, your questions live to the moderator um, during the discussion itself to weave those conversations in. So uh, before any of our speakers get started, I do wanna to touch briefly on something that Karen Andres, the director for our program, highlighted this morning from a survey we put out today. We fielded a large survey of retirement leaders uh, with help from uh, our partners at DCIA on what the pr most promising uh, approaches to achieving retirement security are. And I wanted to pull out one highlight from that, um, from that survey. 
uh, particularly important for our conversation this afternoon is this finding that 77% of the retirement experts and leaders we surveyed support a federal law requiring that all workers have access to a retirement savings program. This is especially notable that this crosses sectors that the private sector, nonprofits, government, and other experts all kind of have the same uh, approach to this. I all kind of agree that this kind of national system uh, should be a priority. This is where the kind of the, the conversation with Ida and Deb came this morning, that since we started these conversations, this kind of growing support from a natural approach to really push access and make sure everyone has access to retirement savings should be a priority for the field. And I think we can see that reflected in this data. This finding also highlights the key theme of this afternoon, and that's we're at an inflection point. Uh, as everyone who's on this call, I'm sure knows, following the news, we're at a moment where a lot of policy change is possible. Some related to retirement savings and some not that are coming down the pike for policymakers. The question for us is whether we can use that moment to really move the needle on achieving a, a retirement savings system that works for everyone in the United States. I can think of no better way to, to kick off that conversation about the opportunity we, we have and the, the policy opportunities on the horizon than by introducing our keynote speaker. The Honorable Richard Neal, Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee was first elected to the House of Representatives in 1988. He has had a long distinguished career of accomplishments in Congress, but most relevant to this conversation is that he's long been a leader on the issue of retirement security, recently championing the passage of the Bipartisan Secure Act, one of the most significant retirement savings reforms in years. While he was not able to join live, we are honored to have his participation to highlight his priorities on retirement security and what his vision is for the next steps for retirement policy this year. Thank you very much for inviting me to this important forum on expanding retirement savings. The Aspen Institute does a great job of bringing together thought leaders from diverse backgrounds and trying to work together to come up with solutions to many of the problems facing our nation, including our retirement savings crisis. So I'm honored to join you with this discussion and certainly to thank you for your leadership. One of my priorities as Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee is to help Americans prepare for a financially secure retirement. Too many workers in this nation reach retirement age without the savings they need. In fact, according to the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College, 50% of the households are at risk of not having enough to maintain their living standards in retirement. The retirement crisis in America is real and will only worsen unless we make it easier to save and do more to encourage workers to begin planning for retirement earlier. Let me take a couple of minutes here to talk about some of the work that we've done already and the work that we're currently doing at the Ways and Means Committee to address the retirement crisis. Let me start with our recent accomplishment in stabilizing multi-employer pension plans. This was a longtime priority of mine that became more urgent during and after the pandemic. About 10 million Americans participate in these plans and about 1.3 million of them are in plans that were at risk of insolvency. Many of these workers are on the front lines of the pandemic right now and the risk to their pension was only exacerbated by the economic catastrophe of COVID-19. And it's important to remember what a pension is. It's a promise that if you work hard today and play by the rules, you will one day be able to retire with dignity and security. Years of hard earned benefits were at risk and at no fault of their own to honest, hardworking people. That's why we had to act and it was the right thing to do. If we hadn't made this a priority, the multi-employer pension system could have collapsed entirely, leaving retirees in poverty, communities in crisis, and businesses in bankruptcy. Therefore, in the recently enacted rescue plan, we created a special financial assistance program under which cash payments will be made by the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, PBGC, to financially troubled multi-employer pension plans. This will allow them to continue to pay retirees benefits. 
The PBGC will be provided with the necessary funds through a general treasury transfer, ensuring that PBGC remains solvent until 2046. To quote the American Federation of Musicians and Employers Pension Fund Local 802 President, he said, it rescued our entire plan overnight. Some people were facing cuts of upwards to 30 to 45 percent of their hard-earned retirement benefits. It changed our outcome overnight in a way that is hard to quantify other than to say it put a lot of lives back together. And this is but one example. The bill was named after Butch Lewis, who drove a truck at USF Holland for 40 years. His wife, Rita, was looking at a massive cut to her pension just as her retirement was in sight. Now, she will be able to rely upon her full pension benefit. This was a huge win. I'm really proud of the work that we were able to do to restore these pensions for over a million retirees and workers. I'm also very pleased that we were able to enact last Congress the Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement Act, also known as the SECURE Act. The SECURE Act is the most significant retirement legislation to come along in well over a decade. The SECURE Act goes a long way toward addressing our retirement crisis, and some of the provisions included are as follows. The SECURE Act requires employers to allow long-term part-time employees to help set aside the prescribed number of dollars in their 401k plans. Thanks to this provision, 4 million Americans will have the opportunity to save at work. The bill makes it easier for small businesses to offer retirement plans to their employees by eliminating outdated barriers to the use of multiple employer plans or MEPs. As a result of this provision, ACLI estimates that 600,000 to 700,000 new retirement accounts will be formed. The SECURE Act also increases the age for required minimum distributions from 70 and a half to 72. This age has not been adjusted since the 1960s. The SECURE Act will make significant improvements to our retirement system, but we all know more needs to be done. And that's why I was pleased to introduce the SECURE Act 2.0 last year with ranking member Kevin Brady. This bill will expand automatic enrollment in 401k plans which significantly increase participation. Since the first defined and, and approved by the Treasury in 1998, automatic enrollment has boosted participation by eligible employees generally, and particularly for black, Latinx, and lower wage employees. An early study found that adoption of the auto enrollment increased participation rate grew significantly by short tenure Latinx employees from 19% to 75%. That's why the SECURE Act 2.0 would require a 401k, 403b, and simple plans to automatically enroll participants in plans upon becoming eligible. For a 2.0 to work, we've also included legislation related to student loans and a 401k matching contribution and increase the required minimum re distribution age even further to 75. We index the catch-up provisions and we also created a higher catch-up amount for people at age 60. These changes will make it a lot easier for American families to prepare for a financially secure retirement. The SECURE Act 2.0 bipartisan legislation has been endorsed by organizations from AARP to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to the American Heart Association. I'll remind you that the SECURE Act passed our committee unanimously and passed the House by a vote of 417 to 3. I anticipate we'll see a similar path with SECURE 2.0 and we hope to move that legislation through our committee in the next few weeks. Our last retirement priority that I'd like to highlight is my auto IRA legislation. We've made tremendous progress in improving our retirement system with the SECURE Act, and we will continue to do so with SECURE 2.0. 
However, the reality is that about 50% of American workers work for an employer that does not offer a retirement plan at work. To make a significant dent in this coverage gap, it is critical that we enact legislation that requires employers that don't currently offer a retirement plan to at minimum provide for their employees with an auto IRA option. When you couple auto IRA legislation with what I've also championed over the last few years to make the savers credit refundable, the results are remarkable. According to a recent analysis commissioned by the American Retirement Association, this could add up to $6.2 trillion in additional retirement savings over a 10 year period and more than 5.1 million new retirement savers multiplied some estimate by much more than that. The potential impact of this legislation on addressing the retirement savings crisis in this country is incredible, and the time has come to get it over the finish line. Therefore, as we consider ideas for our next package over the next couple of months, the auto IRA and the refundable savers credit legislation will be on my short list. Thanks much to all of you today for having me with you. Thank you, Chairman Neal, for your participation in this event and continuing to push to make retirement security a reality across the country. Um, as, as I think you all heard through those remarks, a lot of it has been done on this issue recently, but there's still a lot to do. And that ranges from the specific issues on retirement security and those kind of big swings that we can take, but also all the things that are related to it that include things as related as emergency savings all the way to student loans and really taking the household balance sheet into consideration. Um, so thank you again for joining us. And I think part of what our goal here is with you all on this, on this call and this, in this webinar is to make sure that as we enter this policy moment where a lot seems possible, that we make sure that retirement savings don't get left behind amidst all the other priorities that kind of demand the attention of this moment. Uh, and it's in that context that I'm excited to introduce our next panel focused on how we make sure that we really do have the building blocks we need for a truly accessible, adequate and equitable retirement system, how we fit them together and take advantage of the current policy environment to, environment to make that a reality. So I ask our panelists to turn on their video and microphones. Uh, the panel will be moderated by Ida Rademacher, Vice President of the Aspen Institute and Executive Director of our Financial Security Program. She's joined by Elizabeth Kelly, Senior Vice President of Growth at United Income from Capital One, Kalolo Kijikazi, Deputy Commissioner of the Office of Retirement and Disability Pil Policy at the, at the Social Security Administration, and Catherine Riley, Director of Retirement Solutions at Smart USA. Thank you all for joining us. And just as a quick reminder to our audience, please do use the Q&A function to send us questions for the panel as it goes on, and we'll feed those directly to Ida. Thank you all so much, and Ida, take it away. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Thanks to everybody for joining us again this afternoon for part two of the conversation of the forum. Uh, and welcome uh, to Catherine and Elizabeth and Kilolo. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Great to be here. Uh, I am, uh, hopefully, if we do this right, we've had so many great prep kinds of conversations among many of the panelists uh, that this will really feel like a, an ongoing conversation, one that certainly didn't start with, uh, with just us coming on camera today and certainly won't end uh, when we close the forum today, but, but really to give a broader cross-section of the, the champions, the leaders, the folks who are really trying to figure out how we get retirement policy prioritized as something that really does need to get, as Chairman Neil says, over the finish line, um, moving forward um, with haste as part of, of an inclusive recovery. Uh, I can't think of a better uh, panel to have this conversation with and an all women panel on retirement policy, which I gotta say I, I love and is not exactly a common thing uh, in, in many circles. Uh, but as we go forward, let me just ask you all uh, to introduce yourselves a little bit more by saying you can pick, maybe in addition to the hat you're wearing right now, you have each worn some very interesting other hats that have helped to shape your perspective, 
and your engagement on this issue over your careers. So, uh, and, and I say that as somebody who started out thinking I was gonna be an economic anthropologist um, and then found out that uh, I, I don't think sitting alone in a room and writing a hundred thousand word thesis was ever gonna be something I would, I would finish or uh, would be interesting. It's, for me, it's so much more interesting to engage real people, um, both truly the workers on the ground who are struggling every day to try to make their financial lives whole. How do you translate that real story to policy? That's my story coming into this mix. Uh, but I wonder if you might share a little bit yourselves uh, of your own stories. And um, uh, Kilola, let me start with you. Thanks so much, Ida. And it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I first started on the work on um, social security at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. And we did a lot of work on uh, determining, the, determining the impact of the many proposals coming out um, to reform Social Security at that time. So this was like the 90s through the early 2000s. Um, and in particular, we were looking at the impact on low-income households. And I focused a lot on people of color and women, um, as well as the, the larger um, community of low-income folks. Um, from there, I went to um, the Ford Foundation to work on a, um, a portfolio on asset building and to incorporate in that portfolio work on social security. And social security is one of the largest assets that many households have, but many don't think of social security in that way. So we did a lot of education um, for people outside of the beltway on what social security is, how it's there for, for households before retirement and into retirement and the effect on economic security. And from there, I went to the Urban Institute and did research on economic security, more broadly, but also retirement security, including social security. And throughout all of these um, workplaces, my focus has always been on what is happening to low-income folks, people of color, and, and women. I've gotten to know you with a few of those hats on, and I'm just delighted to see the new one you're wearing as well. So thank you, and, and thank you for your service. Uh, Catherine. How about you? Where, what, kind of, what are a few of the hats that uh, make you sit in a particular unique vantage point today for this conversation? <laughs> thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me here to this conversation. So Ida, you and I have a lot in common. I wanted to study anthropology and went for economics as the supposedly sensible option. So not quite economic anthropology, but close to it. So I started out as an economist. And I actually started my career out in Finland. My mother is Finnish, which explains the slightly exotic location. And there I worked for a large bank asset manager on designing asset management products and specifically designing retirement products because Finland has a very large centralized defined benefit plan. It's a bit like social security, but massively more encompassing. And sort of that, that genuinely is the sort of primary source of retirement income there. And while it's very well organized, it's also rather boring because there's not much you, you can do to innovate things because it's all so fixed. And from there, I went to the Harvard Kennedy School where I studied public policy, did a master's degree in public administration. And I also did a lot of research into international retirement plans, the way that different countries were organizing their retirement finances. And I find that quite fascinating. And that's something I've drawn on a lot throughout my career ever since because it feels like you know there are a lot of really good ideas out there and if you could just pick the best ideas from each country you could actually create a really good retirement system you don't need to reinvent the wheel a lot of the ideas are already out there after that i continued with my passion for retirement i went to state street global advisors where i was head of research for the defined contribution team the global defined contribution team and now i'm at smart which is a UK-based technology company that specifically provides technology platforms for retirement saving. And in the UK, we have our own master trust, which is the UK equivalent of a pooled employer plan. And we're now entering the US market. And I feel like I'm really excited to be working at SMART because technology plays such a key role 
in delivering any of the more innovative retirement saving solutions that we're trying to implement now as the system is changing and people are having to rely on their defined contribution savings more for retirement. So I'm super excited to be speaking here today and thinking about sort of what we can do on the policy front to help implement these new solutions. Fantastic, thanks. And, and Elizabeth, enlighten us. Well, I love all these stories of how, oh, my camera's um, readjusted. I love all these stories of how uh, people sort of got bit by the retirement bug. Um, I think it's fascinating and it's a question that um, I often got um, as a 20 something talking about ERISA at cocktail parties. Um, my story is similar to other folks. You know, I'm a lawyer by training. I was fortunate enough to uh, re receive a fellowship coming out of Yale Law to work at the White House um, and had the opportunity to work on a million different policy areas. So, uh, for example, anti-poverty, housing, um, combating human trafficking, basically everything that a junior staffer does. And I um, really got bit by the retirement bug and the consumer finance bug, which is such an interesting combination of sort of law and taxation and regulation from my background with the pocketbook issues that were so important to me growing up as the daughter of social workers. Um, as I worked my way up, I was fortunate to come to own the retirement consumer finance portfolio, in particular, the fiduciary rule, which was one of those incredibly politically difficult things that might not have happened at the beginning of the administration, but was able to happen at the end. Um, and through that work, got to know a whole amazing community of entrepreneurs uh, who were creating solutions that could provide best in class advice at low cost to people at all different price points and savings levels. And it was such a powerful rejoinder to what we heard time and time again, which was, I can't afford to you know, serve small savers at low cost. I need commissions for this. And the way that technology and data allow people to innovate and challenge these prior business models uh, was really inspiring to me. And part of why I wanted to join a early stage startup company and help it be part of the solution from a private sector perspective, as opposed to a policy perspective when the administration ended. Uh, so I joined a former a uh, Brookings Scholar, another consumer finance nerd, Matt Fellows, um, in helping launch United Income, which uses new day technology to provide lower cost, more holistic advice to people nearing or in retirement, answering questions like, what age should I claim social security? How much can I withdraw each year? When can I retire? All of the multifaceted questions that you face as part of that accumulation or drawdown phase, which is as rightly focused as we are in accumulation building up savings is a lot of times even more complicated for the people facing it and where you can make really dangerous decisions um, that can affect your retirement security because you don't have the years in the workforce to catch up. I um, was fortunate to help build that company over about two years before we sold to Capital One. Um, we, at the time, Capital One was the only top 10 bank without a retirement offering. Um, and we are fortunate to now be that. And that's why I'm here today. Well, I'm, I'm glad to have the breadth of experience. I'm going to tap, each of you are going to basically like stand in for three people for the conversation we're going to have. So thank you for, uh, for wearing all the hats today. Um, I guess I want to start with two things. I mean, just to let everybody know where we're going with this conversation. This is very much around the puzzle pieces of um, both product and policy that need to be in place to uh, serve the entire working population around a retirement savings system, a retirement security system, uh, no matter where they work, how they get paid, how are we gonna make this system work? And, and simultaneously, as we talked about before, it's not a nice to have, right? Retirement uh, savings often feels like such a distant problem compared to all the ones that have been totally exposed in front and center with COVID, but we've actually seen from a lot of the data that's been coming out how intertwined these issues are. And the problem with a chronic problem like retirement insecurity is that it, a lot like a climate change conversation, it becomes a crisis before you ever switched your mind um, to that issue. And, and uh, so there's so many ways to look at that. But I do wanna say for each of you right now, the first question is, what do you see we, we heard a lot this morning about who is and isn't being served by the existing system, but what do you see as the actual barriers uh, right now uh, to why this retirement system we have 
isn't working well. And, uh, and if we need a little more prompting, I'll, I'll pull you there. But I just wonder if we might start with your, from where you sit, what is the thing that makes this system not work for more people and not work better for more people? Um, Catherine, I might wonder, I want to ask you first, because you've been able to look at these other national uh, systems. I wonder what your sense of the US problem is. Well, I think I'd have to agree very much with what Representative Neil was saying just now. I mean, I think that, I mean, retirement is not a ni nice to have, it's a must have, but it's also something that people, most people, we're, we're exceptions, but most people don't get excited about retirement and saving for retirement. And I think it's something that, you know, your employer should be required to offer you it. And of course, the fact is that in the US, first of all, it's voluntary for employers to offer. And secondly, it's exceptionally difficult for employers to offer compared to other countries. You know, here in the US, every employer that off typically the employer sponsors the plan and the employer is the fiduciary for the plan and has to select a plan and take on quite a lot of responsibility, even though there are solutions for small employers to sort of offset some of that, but they still bear far more responsibility compared to employers in most countries where you have a clear mandate that you have to offer a plan, there are clear rules on how much you have to contribute to the plan, and typically there are also specialized plans, I mean like multiple employer plans that the employers contribute to. So the employer is much more in the role of a sort of conduit. It's like making contributions to social security in the US. You have clear rules on what you have to do, you follow the rules and you have just discharged your responsibility. Here we've made it both more onerous for employers to offer it and then let them choose whether or not to offer it. So I hardly think it's surprising that a lot of them are deciding that they have other priorities. Thanks. Who would like to go next? Who wants to jump in with their, their sense of the, the problem? Sure, I'm happy to. So I would echo absolutely what Catherine is saying, is that we have this strange combination of an employer-based system where we make it very hard for employers to do the job we've assigned them, both in terms of the cost and difficulty of setting up plans for small businesses, the fiduciary responsibility associated with making the different investment decisions, um, and really what we should be moving towards is what we see in other countries. Um, as Chairman Neal talked about, the with a universal auto IRA, a universal 401k, we can remove some of that responsibility from employers who are, don't feel equipped to take it on. The bitter irony, I think, in the conversation has been that the pushback on the Hill in past years against the auto IRA proposal what is, was that it was an employer mandate that would put additional burden on employers, when really what we want to do is simplify that. I think the other thing I would add is sort of a problem with the system um, is the way that we allocate incentives. Uh, so right now, the tax preferences that are given to people to contribute to retirement accounts um, are really incentivizing people who are higher net worth and would oftentimes be saving on their own. It's not incentivizing the people who most need to save, as evidenced by the very low take up that we've seen of the savers credit, the limitations of that credit. And we need to shift that balance in order to help, help people who actually need to save and improve the system overall. This is great. These are both big uh, kind of different components of the access problem. And you're just starting to tip into that adequacy issue that we talked about too. Kilolo, you have a, you have a double click deeper sense of where the problem yeah. starts. Uh, and I wonder if you might share that with us. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I hung back a little bit. I wanted my co-panelists to, to have the opportunity to, to go first because I, I have a little bit of a, um, different perspective. And I also want to talk a little bit um, at length. I won't call it a rant, but just talk a little bit more at length um, about this issue. Um, and my perspective is that to achieve an equitable um, retirement savings system, the first step is to remove the impediments. And my, my co-panelists have talked about some, but a, another one is a, a systemic barrier um, and this barrier is structural racism in the labor market. So retirement savings mechanisms are largely based on employment and without equitable access to jobs, especially jobs that pay enough to save for retirement and jobs with employer sponsored um, retirement plans, achieving equitable retirement savings is unlikely. 
structural racism is a key contributing factor to the persistence of employment inequity. Structural racism consists of the policies, programs, and institutional practices that facilitate the social and economic well being of white families while creating barriers to social and economic well being of families of color. Um, Devorah Pager was a Harvard University sociology professor who conducted research on discrimination in the labor market. And in 2017, she co-authored an article about a meta-analysis of every um, field experiment on hiring discrimination against African-Americans and Latinos that was available at the time. She and her colleagues found that racial discrimination in hiring has persisted over time with white job applicants receiving 30, 36% more callbacks than African-Americans and 24% more than Latinos. Research that I've conducted supports um, this finding. On average, African-American workers experience higher rates of unemployment than white workers at every level of education. African-American workers typically receive lower wages than white workers, again, at every level of education. And African-American workers receive lower wages than white workers in every occupation on average. Women of color typically um, encounter both racial and gender um, disparities. African-American women have consistently had higher rates of labor market participation than white women, yet African-American women typically experience higher rates of unemployment than white men and white women at every level of education. And similarly, African-American women are paid lower wages than white men or white women at every level of education. And African-American women are usually paid less than white and black men and white women in every occupation. The Institute for Women's Policy Research estimates that if change continues at this slow pace, as it has done over the last 50 years, it will take 40 years for women to finally reach pay equity. For black women, it will take a century and for Latinas, two centuries. These employment and wage disparities are not the result of individual failures. Um, the evidence shows that higher education does not prevent, um, prevent racial disparities in unemployment and wages. Discrimination in hiring, pay, promotion, and retention were common and um, largely legal practices until the 1960s. And as I just indicated, Racial disparities persist even after the enactment of civil rights legislation outlawing employment discrimination. Occupational segregation also persists today, resulting in the overrepresentation of African American workers in the service sector and underrepresentation in the professional sector. In a study by Derek Hamilton, Algernon Alston, and William Darity, showed that even after controlling for education, 87% of US occupations are racially segregated. Uh, 2015 report by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission showed the persistence of occupational segregation. EEOC data were used to examine changes in employment participation between 1966 and 2013. And the findings show that by 2012, the 7.6% share of African-Americans in professional, the professional sector is still far less than the 12.6% share of African-Americans in the um, civilian labor force. Moreover, the share of African-American workers in the pro professional sector began to decline after 2008. By contrast, the share of African-Americans in the service sector was almost the same in 2013 as it was in 1966, about 23% or almost um, twice as much as the, the share of African-Americans in the civilian labor force. Occupational segregation has implications not only for wages, but also for benefits. The professional sector has some of the highest paid jobs um, at, while wages in the service sector are typically substantially less. And workers 
in the service sector are only half as likely as workers in the management, professional and related sectors to have access to retirement benefits through their employer. Unless and until we eliminate the discrimination in the labor market, workers of color, especially women of color, will have less access to jobs that offer retirement savings plans and receive lower wages from which to save for retirement on their own. So this places workers of color, especially women of color, in a position of being more reliant on social security. Social security provides a progressive benefit such that lower wage workers receive a benefit that is a larger share of their pre-retirement earnings than higher wage workers. Social Security's, Social Security's progressive benefit mitigates the effect of structural racism on retirement benefits, but it does not fully compensate for the effects of discrimination. Consequently, workers of color, especially women, are more likely to experience poverty when they retire than white workers. So we must eliminate structural racism in the labor market if we are to ensure that all workers have a secure retirement. I'm so appreciative of um, the layers of complexity that you just uh, painted, because I think that as we think about solutions and we will pivot ourselves to solutions, uh, as a field, as a retirement field, we, we earlier today even, we even, you know, we're, we're taking heart that there is growing convergent public and private sector and nonprofits and others around the idea that we need a national federal policy solution. But you're saying, uh, and I think rightly so, that it's not that getting everybody access to a retirement savings pro, pro, uh, option uh, still doesn't even begin to hit the equity issues uh, and that there's a lot more deep issues to actually look at in terms of labor market, um, both compensation and, and racial systemic racism as a part of that. So I wanna actually ask if Catherine or, or Elizabeth, anything you wanna say into that as we've kind of tried to shape some dimensions of the problem that we actually can solve for um, in the coming years? Well, I think, I mean, Kilolo obviously is absolutely right that if you are sort of, encountering systemic barriers during your working years and you're earning less money, then you are able to save less money for retirement. So I think she makes a very valid point and I have to say I've always found it somewhat patronizing sometimes when, for example, there are these solutions that are dedicated to helping women save for retirement. And I feel like it's not a question about how do you communicate with women, it's a question because typically they earn lower wages and they tend to have more breaks in service. So they have less assets available to save for retirement. I do think that the, I mean, we can't solve all the problems. We can make a start on solving maybe some of the problems. I do think that the model where there is a federal requirement for every employer to offer every employee a plan, at least remove that problem from the table. So everybody is being put into a plan and you know, automatically being given the opportunity to save. So at least you're not, you, at least you're removing the sort of barrier to access. And that's one good start on the road to promoting a more equitable retirement system. I agree with everything that um, Kilola and Catherine have said. It was, thank you, Kilola, that was just a very powerful um, discussion of all of the many barriers in place and how endemic this is. I think in addition to what Catherine said about making it more important to have universal access because we know there's disparities in access to benefits, it also goes back to what Glula was saying about you know, social security is a progressive system, but do we have to think about ways to make it more progressive to correct for uh, structural and occupational segregation? Um, in addition, going back to what I said earlier, how do we think about how tax incentives and other money that we are spending to incentivize retirement savings is actually exacerbating um, these differences in income that exist um, and adding to the problem rather than helping solve it. Um, and I think that uh, all things that I look forward to discussion with solutions part of our conversation. Well, let's um, let's go there. I would say there's uh, there's not that there's there's very few forums that I think that are. Uh, 
what I what I love about the the kinds of leaders we've been gathering and talking to over the last few years is that there is less and less tolerance for admiring the problem as the ending of the conversation and more to um, let's go ahead and invite all the elephants into the room. Let's have the conversations that need to be had. Let's really think about what it's going to take to build an inclusive, robust saving system. So as we turn to a solutions conversation, you know, again, Chairman Neal and even this morning's conversation, many others are kind of laying out what they see as what's over the horizon. We've, you know, we've certainly in last conver in other conversations, we've said some of the headlines are, we need to make sure that the retirement system, even as we make it more inclusive of more people, needs to actually account for other dimensions of people's financial lives that are interplaying with their ability to save for retirement. Uh, we've said uh, that we need to call out the ways that the retirement saving system right now contributes to the racial wealth gap and explicitly tease out the ways to reverse engineer that problem and see how the retirement saving system could be a net contributor to closing the racial wealth gap. Um, and I think the part of that that is newly part of the conversation more explicitly going forward is the play between how the, the, the social security system needs to be reformed and how retirement uh, savings defined contribution and private sector savings systems need to be performed. Because if we're actually going to be expanding access to a set of individuals who have incredibly complex lives, uh, who have not been served by the private sector savings system before, we wanna make sure we do no harm <laughs> with that access. And we wanna make sure it actually ends up in a, in a place where people feel better off and in fact are materially better off. So when you think about minimum frame for an, a, re, a retirement saving system that we need to be setting our sights on. And Chairman Elian said, Secure 2.0 already in the hopper for you know, discussion in the next few weeks. But within the next few months, there's a real window opportunity to say what's next. What's on your list of the minimum effective framework for retirement policy? And um, uh, I think, well, Elizabeth, you ended before. Why don't you start this time? Sure. Um, minimum is a funny word because in some ways I think that what Chairman Neal- little bigger. I think that would yeah. be helpful too, yeah. I think what Chairman Neal presented is in some ways um, the minimum frame. And obviously the ideas that he were putting forward were terrific, but we're very focused on where we could get consensus. You know, like we're introduced to Cure 2.0 was introduced back when there was a divided Congress. Um, and I think as you say, there's an opportunity to think bigger. Um, at this particular moment in time. So not just universal auto IRA or 401k, which would be a huge step forward, but I think is also not a new idea. It was in all eight of President Obama's budgets um, and couldn't get through for a variety of reasons we've discussed. I think and we've talked a bit about expanding the savers credit, but you know, making it refundable, thinking creatively about whether or not there's a way to actually deposit that money into retirement accounts. Um, so that you're building up those savings for people. Um, you know, President Biden has put forward a proposal uh, that would start to reform retirement tax incentives by capping the deduction that you would receive at 26% and making it more of a tax credit rather than a deduction if you were to contribute to a retirement plan. That would have the effect of lowering the incentive for higher income earners who would be in the you know, 35, 40% brackets. Um, while increasing the incentive for people who might be in lower tax brackets. Um, you know, the last thing that I would throw out is the infrastructure bill that is currently on the Hill um, doesn't have any explicit retirement savings components, but it has what I think is a connected element, which is $400 billion around um, home-based and community-based care. Uh, in our conversation about the integration of the labor market with retirement and um, other components, so much of the question for people and whether or not to be able to have enough money in retirement is what are their health care or long-term care expenses? And that's further segmented from the conversation, um, but I think has been brought to light with COVID, how very, very real that is for so many people and how ensuring that they have coverage for health, long-term care is really a part about whether or not they can enjoy a secure retirement. One more thing I saw in the comments, which I would throw out is, you know, obviously in the earlier versions of the American Rescue Package, um, there was proposal to increase the minimum wage, which going back to Kalilo's point about how do you actually address the income inequities in order to enable people to better save, 
raising the minimum wage is an idea that's in the ether that I think we should start considering as part of the retirement policy conversation. I should say that nothing that I've said to date or will say thereafter uh, reflects the views of Capital One, but only my own very strongly held views. Thank you for clarifying that hat. <laughs> Uh, Kilolo, I think you were you were called upon a few times in, in Elizabeth's remarks. Maybe maybe go next. Sure, sure although I'll, I'll be briefer this time since I took up so much time on my my initial response. Um, and I should also say that my remarks are my own and should not be assumed to reflect the positions of of um, the Social Security Administration. Um, you know, for me the minimum is is really i think for many what would what many are working towards um, and we're not quite there yet and it's it's really going back to Catherine's point about everybody should be covered everyone should have um, a a pension retirement security plan um, that allows them to Put aside funds and you know ideally has um, matching funds contributed so that they can prepare for for retirement and it shouldn't in my view shouldn't be limited to you know people who are working full-time part-time workers seasonal workers still re need retirement security um, so that's that I, I feel is is a minimum if if what if we're serious about everyone being secure in retirement. Thank you, Kalila. Catherine. So, I mean, I think we're all very much aligned on the fact that we should have universal access and have it be a federal framework, which is unified, because while I very much applaud the states for the initiative that they have taken, it is going to be an unworkable patchwork for employers who potentially have operations or employees in various states having to conform to mandates of several different, several different types of mandates. I do think it's also important to stress that universal really means universal because the more, every time these mandates are introduced in the US, there are exclusions. And the more exclusions you make, eliminating employ employers who have fewer than 20 employees or eliminating brand new employers, you reduce the coverage gap. For example, the Center for Retirement Initiatives at Georgetown University has done some excellent sort of calculations on this. So basically, if you, for example, exclude employers with more than 20 employees who've been operating for fewer than three years, you only, a mandate would only catch half of the currently uncovered. You really need to extend it to everybody. I'd, and based on the UK experience, so the UK introduced mandatory automatic enrollment, the requirement for every employer to offer a plan starting in 2013. And it really is every employer, not employers over a certain threshold. And they in increased coverage in the private sector from about 40% to 88% in just a few years. And the experience of small employers has also been, generally speaking, very favorable. So with modern technology, it is possible to make it very easy for small employers to sign up. In fact, in sort of research that's been done afterwards, most of the small employers said that it cost less than they expected and it took far less time than they expected. I mean, on our own Smart Pension Master Trust in the UK, the average employer size on our Master Trust is nine employees. So it is very, I'd like to debunk this myth that you know, the smaller the employer, the more difficult it is to offer a plan. It is perfectly possible to make it very easy for employers of any size to offer a plan. And of course, the um, SECURE that passed last year allows multiple employer plans and some of which, which could end up taking the form of some of the master trusts that you talk about, right? How do you pool the, the, yes. the retirement uh, plans for, for small employers? How do you, how do you figure out that, that problem? I think I'd, that, also like, yeah. I'd also like to put in a quick plug for the savers credit that Elizabeth and Kilolo both mentioned, because I actually think that the refundable savers credit is really, I think it's a very elegant solution in that it targets people at the lower end of the, the income spectrum. It's like a kind of, if it's refundable, it's like a government matching contribution, particularly when you think about 
probably, unfortunately, the people at the lower end of the income spectrum are the ones that are most likely to only be offered the auto IRA option rather than a 401k. And I think it's a very good way of sort of both helping those people while not necessarily having to dismantle the whole system that is, you know, currently working fairly well. And whenever you change the rules, you always introduce unintended consequences. And I'd also like to echo what Elizabeth was saying about sort of getting it into retirement accounts. I think it's very important for these contributions to be invested in a way which is as productive as possible for these people. So these contributions should be going into the same type of retirement investments as you would be getting in an employer plan, rather than putting them into treasury bills, which are not good long-term investment vehicles. So I hope that we can find a way to make that kind of solution work as well. Uh, let me let me take us then to the, I think this the, we're getting a little bit, not just to the minimum frame is not just about the access. You guys are all across, across sector, um, can't, even counting all your hats, across sector. <laughs> and this is what our data showed too with the expert survey. It's actually not very controversial at all across, it's a, it, uh, at the state level, there's a lot of bipartisan support. There's some federal issues that make that not quite as bipartisan yet, but there is a way that having 77% of industry supportive of a federal policy solution for universal automatic uh, auto IRA means that the, in terms of the broader ecosystem of people that are focusing on retirement, there's a lot of, there's a lot of convergence around that being uh, an absolute minimum of what needs to change. The other part that you're getting into though is this idea about adequacy. And, and, and I wonder if you could say, and again, because what I wanna to get to there is refundable savers credit um, and then with or without, to your point, Catherine, the employer match piece as well. There is a way that um, individuals self-insuring against all of their own long-term risk by just their own savings, having the benefit of compound interest is probably not gonna help them make enough. But the idea about how do you actually get those accounts adding up quickly. And by the way, that makes a lot makes it a lot quicker to have, to your point, Elizabeth, profitable accounts or assets under management that actually start to be meaningful in terms of people's own engagement with the identity of their own selves as somebody who has some level of financial security, some nest egg. But underneath this, sorry, I'm rambling on here. We get back a little bit to what does it take to build momentum? What does it take to actually, um, finish debunking myths, understand who else needs to come on board, actually get over the last mile of um, how these kinds of systems become reality. In, in, so, so when I think about what we have to grapple with and maybe what are additional ways, and this is where if we were at the forum, we would then have many breaks, we'd have overnight conversations, we'd have a lot of back and forth debate about what it's actually gonna take, where do we go next? I'm, I'm just struck by, um, maybe Elizabeth, maybe it was a little bit of what you said. Um, there's just some fundamental things we have to reframe. And part of it is, I'm gonna, I'll put this out there. Many of you have touched on the role of the employer, that that needs to change. Many have touched on the issue of um, the labor, mar occupational segregation and the labor market itself might have to change as well for these to be adequate savings for everybody. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how the role of the employer could or should change and how, like if that's one of those things that's starting out with people on opposite ends of what's the role of the employer in retirement savings and getting someplace where we can actually change the system. Um, I just wonder if you might say a little bit more about that. Sure, I'm happy to. Oh, go ahead, Catherine. No, no, you go ahead, you start. I will follow up. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, so one of the problems we haven't talked about, we're all, you know, universal auto IRA has been this buzzword for what, 12 years now, although I, mean, I think it was, you know, David John and Mark Ebrey that put it out back in 2006. So we're going on its 15th year anniversary. Um, I think it may be time to think even bigger. Um, when he was running, you know, now President Biden put out a proposal for a universal 401k with the idea being that you'd have higher contribution limits but it would also be a vehicle that an employer could contribute to if they wanted to. If they wanted to make the contribution for their employee, but didn't want to take on the burden of offering the plan, being a fiduciary, everything else. Um, 
when we were pitching state auto IRAs, we got so much pushback because it was, well, it's going to crowd out the employer role, but I'm not entirely sure that's a bad thing. I think if there was a federal offering that employers could choose to take advantage of if they did not want to offer their own plan and employers that wanted to offer plans and have that be sort of a key differentiator for them in the labor market as they're competing for talent, like that to me is a potentially workable solution and a way that could allow both the private sector innovation while removing some of that burden and sort of evolving the employer-based system that so many of our benefits are based off of. I mean, with the other thing that we've touched on is obviously around 1099 contract workers who have previously been excluded from that. And with universal 401k or those types of mechanisms, we can open up federal benefits so they're able to benefit. We saw that you know, happen with uh, unemployment insurance back last March, when for the first time through the pandemic unemployment assistance program, 1099 part-time other workers who had not previously been able to benefit were now buying into that federal system. And I think COVID really gives us an opportunity um, to help build on that. Catherine, what were you going to say? Um, actually, I'll follow on from what you were saying. So I think that I agree with you on having a federal system. I don't necessarily think that the federal government needs to provide a 401k plan. So, for example, in the UK, when they rolled out um, automatic enrollment, the government did set up a government options nest. To, and the idea was that you're requiring all these employers to offer a plan. What about if the small employers can't find anyone to offer them a plan? So Nest was going to offer a plan free of charge to all employers. And the government gave it a fairly large subsidized loan to start up operations. And I do think that Nest performed a very valuable role in sort of setting a benchmark. But the interesting thing is that since a lot of private sector providers, smart included, have also come into the market, and are providing sort of comparable or superior services on a purely sort of commercial basis without the need of any government funding and providing access to people. So I don't think that you need the government to actually provide a plan. I think the important thing is for the government to have a framework that is sufficiently robust that the private sector can then sort of provide the solution to. And I think it's important for it to be sufficiently stringent too, because for example, one thing I've noticed now that we have PEPs, which I think is a wonderful thing, and we've seen about at least 50 providers and counting sign up as sort of PEP providers. And I've noticed that there are very different flavors of PEPs. You have some where there is a very independent pool plan provider overseeing all the sort of service providers which are all independent companies and you have others where it's a very bundled model and the employer is technically actually responsible for overseeing the structure so if we have some sort of a federal mandate i'd hope that there would be a clear 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 rules on exactly what the minimum has to be because we're not doing the employers a favor by offering them several different flavors of pep and then they have to go and do the homework on which to choose. They need, they need to be confident that when they're choosing something called a sort of compliant plan, then they really are compliant and they've discharged their duties. So I'm gonna focus on the, the aspect of your question, which was about um, building momentum. Um, and rather than um, speaking to a particular plan, um, focusing more on the, the strategy for, for building and sustaining momentum. And I'm all for those who are, in, are affected having a voice at the table, decision-making table. And um, while at the um, Ford Foundation, the work that I was speaking about that we funded was providing um, community organizations and um, community members with information about social security, but this could be about um, retirement security more broadly so that people could then determine what it is that they want and, and voice their, their, um, their choices and, and, and make them known not only within their community organizations, but you know, at a national level too. So when we funded work, we provided funding for people to, um, do, to um, disseminate information and then to 
give people platforms for um, speaking to what it was that they they wanted. And I think that is a, a great way to build momentum, not just within the Beltway and within those of us who have expertise about this, but more broadly across the, the country so that um, workers um, and families can say, this is what would work best for, for me. I'm so glad you brought that in, Kilolo. One, because I remember that so many of the people I still work with to this day and so many of the organizations we brought into the retirement forum are people I met uh, who were your grantees uh, as I was part of that, that world of um, incredible possibility that you created when you were at Ford. Um, and to that point too, I just, I guess, and another double click on the possibility there, it's, we certainly are hearing echoes of what Treasurer Godlewski was talking about today when she, earlier today, when she said she was, you know, she was listening, she was talking to her own constituents over the course of COVID and uh, people want the opportunity to save. Uh, and they certainly uh, saw the value of it, even if they, what they needed was emergency savings and what they had was a retirement savings opportunity. We actually saw from some of the data, the kind of ways that emergency savings is a buffer to preserve your retirement savings, but that people want these things. And then another thing I'll bring in to your point, Catherine, about technology and who has it and how that can be used for momentum and voice in the conversation about the future of retirement. It also speaks to some of the other kinds of participants we brought into the forum over time. So last year we had the founder and CEO of, of Alice. We've had people um, from much more of the kind of FinTech side of things that can use their, even if they engage with their own customers around a completely different thing, they can ask them questions about their policy mm -hmm. ideas. So you could, so for example, Saver Life it does an, is an emergency savings organization, focuses on very low income households and building their first $500. But they actually worked with Cal Savers in, the, in California to survey their, um, their users to see what level of savings should be the anchor for the Cal Savers program. Three, you know, everybody marks at 3% auto IRA, these were very low income, um, and I'm on the Saver Life board, which is why I remember all this data so well. These are very low income individuals. Not only did they have an incredibly overwhelming response of voice to come back, even in, even in that digital way, but they said they'd rather anchor at 5%, you know, and it really did change a sense of things. So I think that both in the high touch ways and in the ways that we use technology, it's not just about the innovation around product, it's the innovation around process for how we can move this conversation forward that I think is really, really exciting. Um, one other thing I want to talk about that we, we've touched on a little bit in our, um, in our, in our in round off, off camera was another barrier to traction um, on retirement policy is that it actually doesn't live in one place in the federal government, right? There's parts of it at Department of Labor, there's parts of it at Treasury, there's parts of it at SEC. There is kind of at the end of the day, nobody who's like beat is retirement policy. Um, and I wonder if you could comment on that at all, e either, you know, is that true or false for you? Do you see that as creating some of the friction with progress? Um, and are there, are there ways that other countries do this that we should take a page from as we're thinking about uh, what what are the ways that we begin to, and maybe it's not retirement, maybe it's maybe it's financial security, maybe it's not just retirement security, but I'm just wondering how the, the fractioning of leadership at the federal level is part of the, the, the problem here. And I, I guess I'll look at Elizabeth, I'll look at you first. Sure, um, I will say that working uh, in the federal government, we were always very jealous of the Financial Conduct Authority or FCA over in the UK um, and the way that they were able to um, move quickly and decisively and present uniform guidance. There's a reason that they were ahead of us in innovating first with getting rid of commissions on financial advice, then with um, requirement that employers offer plans. Um, so certainly from a, uh, everyone sitting on this room perspective, how do you get things done? And it is unquestionably appealing, but I think it also, it limits the creativity of our solutions, uh, because of this fragmentation and also creates its own barriers. So I think, you know, for example, we've talked about lessening employer burden. We've talked about, you know, enabling innovation in the financial services market. 
Um, both of those things are complicated by the fact that there is this existing regulatory patchwork between SEC, DOL, Treasury in terms of taxation. Um, in some ways, you know, the CFPB was intended to sort of be the uniform you know, financial assistance regulator. But my understanding and folks who were there, I was not. I was actually over in the UK uh, where Catherine's from um, back at the time that they explicitly carved retirement investment out of the CFPB mandate, therefore actually like continuing this fragmentation um, in a way that I think we may live to regret. I think the other thing I would say about that, Ida, is we've talked about the federal fragmentation. There's also obviously the federal and state fragmentation. So the state insurance regulators are able to regulate a lot of insurance products where there's questionable or limited SEC or DOL authority. Um, the last piece is we haven't even brought health into the conversation. And as we think about long-term care and healthcare as being part of really how are we planning for a secure retirement, HHS is on the far end of the table. Um, so it is reform that I think is eager, I'd be eager for and is much needed, but we're a very long way away. And just even having a conversation with such a varied group of folks as we have on the call here today, I think is a good step. Mm -hmm. Catherine, any, any sense from you? Um, yes, yeah, so I mean, a couple of thoughts. I mean, I do think that it possibly could be helpful to have a kind of minister for pensions, as you suggested at some point. I mean, we have these sort of, I mean, there are certain senators and members of Congress, like Representative Neal, who are very dedicated to the topic of retirement security and have been working in the, the area for sort of decades to advance it and doing a lot of good work. It is sort of very frustrating that secure you know, secure 1.0, there was broad consen consensus on most of the provisions in it for years, and yet the bill couldn't get passed because it had to be tacked on to some other bill. And I'm hearing similar concerns about secure 2.0. You know, this is one of the few areas where you have bipartisan consensus, and yet because of the decision-making process, somehow it's difficult to bring these bills to the floor and get them passed. So maybe if you had a more dedicated sort of decision-making body for that, you could pass retirement bills on their own merits. Maybe I'm being very unrealistic here. But sort of, and like you said, it does feel very fragmented. And what I see too is a lot of, a lot of the emphasis in ERISA, for example, it's all about fiduciary responsibility for investments. Whereas, as you, meant, as you mentioned just now, I think sort of, you know, we really need to be thinking about retirement solutions, where it's more than just the investments. Obviously, the investments are a very important part of a retirement solution, but there is also a lot more than just the investments that you need to be worried about. I mean, investments are only one part of the cost. And in fact, in a lot of cases, they're the smallest part of the cost of a retirement plan. You need to look at the administration and all the communications and how can people stay in their plan. So I do think that some sort of a more holistic view of retirement would be very helpful to sort of providing these solutions that people need. Mm. And Kilolo, I know that you may not be able to talk on the record about this, so feel free to pass on my question. But certainly the other, the other question as we think about how reforming the private sector savings part of retirement policy with this goal of financial security in mind has everything to do with the implications of the social security system as well. And so another one of these places where we need to bring the conversations together uh, consistently and holistically is about the reforms required in, in both kinds of places to, to get to the goals, the stated goals of financial security for workers. Certainly. Um, so I'll, I will say kind of um, more generally that there is a good deal of interagency work that's going on right now. And so there may be opportunities to have that work also um, take a look at what could be done across agencies with respect to retirement security or economic security more broadly, as you put it. But there certainly are probably opportunities for um, public private sector um, exchanges as well about what needs what's needed in terms of um, creating a, a secure retirement for for workers and their families, um, given what we have with social security and and the knowledge that 
it was never intended to be the only source of retirement security. What, what is needed, um, you know, having, having an exchange between public and private sector, what is needed in the, in the private sector realm in order to create that, that secure retirement. Well, my, my own team will kill me because I know we have, we have four upcoming uh, you know, dialogues on access, uh, on uh, lifetime income and, life, and cash flow, on, on um, portability and on racial equity. But I think what we're talking about here too is uh, number five, which is what it's really gonna take for a coordinated approach to, to get sticky in this country is like, is that part of what it's gonna to take to get this over the finish line is not just the leadership in Congress, um, the leadership of so many new private sector voices being in support of policy uh, change uh, and product innovation, but also outside of the forum and all of the incredible other places where people are meeting some kind of really, really named uh, structure that can help, help us kind of keep things going in the same direction. I, I love that idea. Um, there's a lot of questions here and I'm trying to pull up a couple as we're in our last couple of minutes here. Uh, some of them were about, just to give you a couple of highlights, some of them were about gig workers. We, we were all, all on board with everybody should be covered, but of course there's some issues still with um, contractors and gig workers. Uh, there was also a couple of questions here around, um, where did my, where did they just go, Karen? <laughs> I'm looking at my, my cheat sheet list of things coming up. Um, a little bit, you know, we've talked a little bit about the, 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 the social security piece, but certainly there's probably more to be said about tax policy and retirement savings as well. Um, but I guess as, I, as, we, as we close out, I think the one question I'd put to you all is either, either feel free to think about the, the particular, if it's the particular population, you know, the issues you have to address, but, but you know, when you, when you leave today, when we leave the forum, when we think about the hundreds of people watching that are that tune into this for something a little different than a, some of the other re retirement conversations that happen, um, who do you need to be, you know, who do you need to be working with? Who do you need to be uh, connecting to, uh, to solve some of those problems today? And a year from now, what would you like to think is different about the, either the way we're having the conversation or the things that we've been able to solve for? A year is a, as we've seen in the past year, a year is a long time. A lot can happen. And especially with the windows of opportunity that have opened with policy, you know, what's what's possible in this next year and what what's your, what are you hoping for in terms of that? What can change? So I'll just circle back to, to what I started out with in the beginning and the absolute need to eradicate discrimination in the labor market. And so we need to work with whomever we can on on that issue um, to ensure that that this is is eliminated, um, and I'll just stop there because I'm not sure how much I can say on the record. Thanks, Kilolo. I mean, my dream would be that some of the very ambitious legislation around expanding universal access would have passed in a year's time, and I think this is not guaranteed, but certainly possible. And for that, I suppose we would be, need to be working together as the retirement industry and working very closely with legislators. I think that's a really important step towards expanding to improving retirement equity in this country. I think for me, you know, my goal coming out of this conversation every year is how can we as a retirement community work more closely with housing advocates, healthcare advocates, to really sort of create a universal frame and approach to how do we help people tackle the multi-dimensional problems they have in retirement. And I think that's not only sort of right from an individual's perspective, um, but it may also be right from a political economy perspective. Much as I'd love for Catherine and Chairman Neal to be right and Secure 2.0 and other retirement reforms to be passed in the next year, there's still a long line and it's not always like the first legislation that is passed. So how can we think about the moments that do exist, the things that are happening, um, to make sure that they're informing, retirement is informing that conversation, be it money for housing in the infrastructure bill or money for caregiving in the infrastructure bill. How can we work with those stakeholders 
to help advance our agenda uh, in innumerable ways. And you're probably, in that sense, to already taken a sneak peek at our work plan for the next few months, Elizabeth, um, in both of those kinds of conversations. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm grateful to all of you for joining us today. And, uh, and I'm gonna turn it back over to, to Tim Shaw to round us up for the day. Um, as we mentioned before, there'll be a rapporteur's report from not only this conversation and some of the layers and ideas that came out, but from these off the record conversations where we'll be going deeper on a set of issues over the next couple of months. Um, and I continue to be hopeful about this as an area where we really can create um, not just momentum, but real change because of who's committed and, and how far we've come in the last five years and, and how far we have to go together. So thank you very much. Thanks for joining us, the whole panel, Kilolo, Elizabeth, Catherine, uh, and thanks. I'll turn it back to Tim now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us, Catherine, Kalolo, and Elizabeth, and Ida for that fantastic conversation. Um, there, I think there was just a wonderful capstone to the conversation that, that we've had today. And there are a few things that really come to mind for me in terms of what it, what it means for what we have going forward. The first is that this, this is still a moment of opportunity that we continue to hear through this morning and into this conversation, some of the key next steps that we really are, a lot of us are on the same page about, and that we can to, to move forward and take advantage of this next opportunity uh, for policy change. Uh, whether it's making it easier for uh, businesses to provide these plans to their employers to improve the types of support that uh, workers get in and actually doing that saving and making it easier to do, those are all important steps. The second thing that occurs to me is a little more bracing is that there is just so much work to do. I think Kalolo's points about the structural racism embedded in the labor market means that like we have this window and I think everyone is kind of actively talking about it. Elizabeth uh, alluded to at the end there that there's a long line of things to get done and that even if we do all these things that we just talked about today, there'll be a lot more to do. But the last thing that makes me excited is that they, we have this community of you all that have joined us and stayed for like these, like at this end of this pandemic when we've been on so many Zooms, I can't tell you how many Zooms I've been on since we started this, this journey uh, and this kind of terrible season together, that you all are still here and that we have this active chat talking about this conversation, excited about what we're going to do next uh, and how we're going to take on these challenges together. And I find that really exciting. So before we close out the day, we have a few asks of you um, that I want to, to close us out with. Uh, the first is that um, as uh, Ida mentioned, we are going to be having a report coming out on kind of what was included in this conversation, but also the private conversations that'll be coming up <clears throat> that pull together four of the key, four of the key key elements of retirement security that we heard here today, access to automatic enrolled retirement plans, making retirement plans portable, lifetime income and retirement security and racial equ equity in the retirement system. If you want those direct to your inbox, please sign up for our newsletter right here. Um, that will also get you uh, first come access to the upcoming events that I think are deeply related to this conversation. On April 28th, we have one about the future of workers and financial security that really brings together the nexus of all these different conversations that we talked about here today, retirement as a benefit, but also all the other benefits that are essential to achieving financial security for workers. We'll have another one coming up in May on emergency savings and where we think the policy opportunities are there. And then another in June on the kind of entire web of evidence and innovation going on for savings as a whole. And I think everyone on this call would be really interested in those conversations as well. In addition to that shameless plug for uh, FSP's work, I do have a few other requests as we go, uh, as you take this conversation back uh, into your, your everyday work. Uh, the first is for those of us in the retirement field, I think many one, one issue that has continued to come up in particular in the last year, in particular since the last forum, but has been said over and over um, through the years, especially by people of color, is that racial equity needs to be a priority for our field. 
um, and it's it's growing. It's been too slow to get here. Uh, but in our survey of experts and retirement leaders, the vast majority of people said their organizations are making racial equity a priority. And I would encourage you all to continue to make that a priority for your organizations or start it up if, if it isn't yet. And to also commit to making that real change um, and not just lip service. The second thing is that as a field, uh, we should continue to expand and ask questions about what the retirement security and the retirement field can do to help these other aspects of fi financial security that we know are into intimately linked to people's retirement security. Uh, this conversation, just to name a few, referenced the care economy, emergency savings, medical debt, and student debt, and many more. And there are ways to link these things together and, and, and have those conversations about how we can be supportive of other groups uh, doing work that will also further our goals when it comes to a, uh, a, a secure retirement for all. The last is to engage with us. Let us know what you think about the ideas you heard here today and what you'd like to hear next coming out of these conversations. The only way that we're able to provide the conversations that you heard today are through talking with people like you and getting your feedback. The agenda that, is, that we dr have driven for the past five years on these issues have come from your willingness to engage. And we've seen a lot of that in chat today. We've had a lot of those conversations. We need that to continue. And if you have any questions about the ideas you heard today or, or need help with some of the things and how to push uh, push forward on issues of racial equity or how to expand the realm of financial of, of retirement security to those other areas, let us know and we're happy to connect you to the folks who are the leaders on those issues right now. I'd like to thank again all of the all of the speakers we had here today for their thoughtfulness and the dedication and commitment to this this issue. And I want to especially also thank our funders again, ARP, JP Morgan, Asset Management, and Prudential. And last, I want to thank you. Again, we have all these leaders that have come here today and are, are pushing these issues forward, but this is an ecosystem of everyone and everyone who's on this call has a role to play and really advancing and making reality the vision for a, ret uh, a secure retirement for everyone that was put forward today in our conversations. So thank you for joining us. Stay safe and we look forward to engaging with you soon.